Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Analyzing Highly Multiplexed and Multimodal Spatial Omics Chip Cytometry Datasets. I am Kaylee Bach of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Canopy Biosciences, a Brugger company. To learn more, visit CanopyBiosciences.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, John Spencer Schwartz, Product Manager, Chip Cytometry Instrumentation at Canopy Biosciences. Spencer, you may now begin your presentation. Hi, uh, my name is John Schwartz. I'm a Product Manager for Canopy Biosciences. Uh, specifically serving the instrumentation and software products for our spatial offerings. So Cellscape really represents uh, the continuation of uh, a decade and a half long journey um, to bring chip cytometry kind of where it is today. Uh, so again, the Cellscape can collect the same biologically relevant data set, very high spatial resolution, very high dynamic range imaging. Uh, you can still use uh, anyone's antibodies, uh, which makes it economically uh, efficient. Uh, as well as very versatile. Uh, now it just goes uh, at a speed, at a throughput, so that it can actually keep up with experiments uh, that are being performed here and now. Um, <clears throat> so to start here, uh, just an overview of kind of physically what we do with these samples. Um, so we can look at either a cell suspension or alternatively a, a tissue sample, essentially anything that you can section, um, put onto a slide or anything that you can pipette is something we can work with. Uh, we then go through these rounds of five plex iterations where we will stain with five antibodies at a time. Uh, we will image, uh, we will then photo bleach, and we will image again. Um, <clears throat> at any point in the cycle, uh, just because of the way we're doing this, uh, you can, of course, um, pull the sample off of the instrument and actually store that uh, in the case of cell suspension, since we've done all our validation data in. Uh, for cell suspension, it's actually up to 36 months at this time. Um, because we're using base fluorescence uh, and we're only using five channels instead of a bunch of different channels and trying to unmix them or anything like that, uh, it really opens you up to being able to basically use in the fluoresces in those five channels, which also means that we can take a look at mixed modality detection. Uh, so, of course, uh, taking a look at RNA as well as protein is uh, what absolutely everyone wants to do right now. Very, very popular, which makes a ton of sense. Um, but consider cases where, uh, you know, maybe uh, maybe you have an interleukin or some other cytokine uh, that is actually dispersed into the cells, uh, excuse me, into the interstitium. Um, if that's the case, then it's very difficult to associate that signal, which would be, you know, very diffuse through uh, this entire uh, sample, uh, associate that with a particular cell and quantify it. Um, the ability to combine RNA and protein together uh, makes it very easy to quantify uh, the uh, expression level via uh, RNA signature uh, with the expression of protein uh, with direct detection. Uh, really, really excited to show this to you guys. So the Cellscape can actually collect images at 182 nanometers per pixel. Uh, so this image is absolutely crisp. Uh, we're actually able to collect here, if you look at the cellular features. Um, so what I'm personally really excited about this or why I'm really excited about this is, you know, at 500 nanometers per pixel, uh, you can certainly do cytometry with this. That's no problem. Uh, you can separate individual uh, cells. You can also tell the difference between two cells and kind of assign signal accordingly. Um, <clears throat> what 182 nanometers per pixel allows us to do is truly say that we have subcellular resolution. Now, I've tried to pick out one of these little features here that kind of illustrate that, uh, but the ability to see these smaller subcellular features is what's going to, I think, power kind of the next step of chip cytometry uh, and the next step of cytometry in general, uh, which is not just locating where a signal is on a cell, but locating where a signal is in a cell. I find that very, very exciting. Um, <clears throat> so the entire optical train, the camera, uh, the optics, as well as the objective, uh, gives you basically this high resolution image at 182 nanometers per pixel. It gives you very efficiently 
Um, and it gives you over this huge, huge field of view so that we can collect these data sets that are very, very high spatial acuity, very high uh, HDR, or very high signal to noise. We can also collect them very efficiently. Uh, so that's essentially kind of the introduction of Cellscape. Uh, so we can still use versatile reagents from trusted vendors, you be your BioLegion. Uh, this uh, also applies to anything that's either, uh, you know, an exotic marker or alternatively an, uh, an exotic uh, model uh, per se. Uh, we can still give you uh, biologically relevant data, uh, meaning HDR imaging and very, very high spatial acuity data now. Uh, but what we've done here is especially the Cellscape is engineered it for practical implementation. So this last talk is to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, chip cytometry data analysis. Um, so we'll kind of break this into three sections. Uh, the first is kind of going over the utility of the, uh, just kind of gross overview, the utility of the um, ZKW app uh, analysis features. So basically what's on board the instrument. Uh, after that, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, extending this data set uh, because the, Features or the uh, applications that are actually supported by this data set uh, far exceed what uh, is actually included within the software. Uh, when you consider that it's HDR data, that you get um, all the different kind of uh, ways you can slice and dice our data sets, uh, they end up being really, really powerful. Um, and then we'll kind of end uh, with well, a few examples of kind of what you can do with this, and then a little bit of a discussion as far as kind of where we're going uh, with, uh, with data analysis for chip cytometry in the future. Um, so let's maybe start with the uh, kind of standard pipeline. Um, but I wanted to start here uh, just with cells. The reason being that uh, this tool set was actually designed to work with cells. Um, so <clears throat> it's uh, in most cases segmenting uh, these uh, cells actually doing a, a pretty good job. Um, so this is CD45. Um, that was stained on PBMCs. Um, but the thing to consider here is actually the image that's being processed uh, with our uh, segmentation protocol um, is actually uh, the transmitted light image. Um, <clears throat> what's cool about this, there we are. Uh, what I find very kind of unique about this is uh, this actually was you know, a, a, a very nice application of artificial intelligence. Um, so, you know, there's no great intensity difference between kind of cells and background here. It all is uh, all the information as to what's a cell and what's not a cell is really encoded in the shape, uh, the shape of those cells um, and kind of the, uh, the gradations across the field here. Uh, what I think is interesting about this, though, is if you bring up the segmentation, it actually works quite well. Um, <clears throat> so we can not only find these individual cells, it can actually, you know, like uh, it can uh, exclude cells that are of the wrong shape because of apoptosis. It can exclude cells that are the wrong size. Um, it does an actually really, really good job at finding cells <clears throat> in a uh, in a bright field image. Uh, so we can take this data, and really the idea again is is truly, uh, or the pipeline, I should say, and the tools are really uh, set up to do cytometry. Uh, so let's th take this image, um, this microscopy image, and let's do cytometry with it. Uh, so again, for each of these cells that have been identified, I get expression values for every single one of them. Uh, I can then cast those as dot plots. And you can see, um, so we kind of rebuild these plots. Uh, <clears throat> we can see that we actually get really, really good grouping uh, when we have a cell suspension like this. And it's very easy in typical cases to, to make uh, calls between populations. On top of that, when we, even when we get into more complicated, uh, you know, and, and more difficult to uh, discern uh, population differences, um, you can actually use kind of communication between uh, this population or uh, this uh, intensity uh, profile or this intensity dot plot. And of course, the um, images, uh, image data, uh, which are um, have their binaries located. Uh, so for each of these, uh, to kind of uh, essentially cross correlate your your results here. Um, so you know, I can kind of go back to this uh, image set, and I can let's see here, click 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 away here. Uh, so let's go back to the HDR image. Um, and we can take a look at something simple like, uh, you know, who's a, who's a leukocyte, uh, then maybe we'll also add uh, uh, T cytotoxic, T helper cells, uh, and maybe we can kind of take a look at those two. We'll get rid of this guy, let's get rid of this guy. Uh, so I should, of course, be able to bring up then, let's take a look here and find CD4 and CD8. 
Here's CD4, very nice. Um, and then also CD8, excuse me, CD4 and CD8 here. Cool. Yeah, so here you can tell we differentially, um, you know, identify these individual populations. So again, the, you know, the, the uh, pipeline's already really, really good at doing this. Um, so once you get a nice segmentation of your cells, you have all the tools uh, kind of at your disposal as uh, onboard in order to do this sort of work. Um, <clears throat> Where it becomes complicated is uh, if we go to the uh, if we go to the um, uh, tissue case. So the same set of tools is actually available for tissue analysis, uh, but you'll notice if you take a look at these tissue plots, uh, the overlap between uh, the uh, the two signals, any two signals essentially, is much much closer uh, in the case of tissue than it is in the case of cells. Um, and this has everything to do with the, um, the tissue segmentation algorithm that's implemented within the software suite currently. Um, <clears throat> so if you'll take a look at this, uh, really the issue that we have here, if we take a look at that same graph uh, of CD4 versus CD8 T cells, and we'll kind of bring up a few of those guys here. Um, but if I cast some of those gates, uh, let's do something that's easily indistinguishable or distinguishable rather, let's do immune cell versus epithelial cells. Um, and show our segmentation. So um, even with pretty decent segmentation, you can see where you get the uh, uh, cells rather that are very closely opposed to each other. So this is what we're really referring to when we say spectral, or excuse me, spatial, uh, spatial spillover, spatial overlap. Um, <clears throat> depending on uh, you know what you call what cell in this individual, uh, in each of these images, you're going to get um, uh, your binaries uh, overlapping to some extent. Uh, I would mention too that so in this particular case, the uh, the size of these are are not actually uh, truly indicative of the segmentation. So I'll bring that up too, just so you can kind of see what the actual raw segmentation is. Yeah. Uh, so here we're still basing this on a nuclear st uh, nuclear stain, um, as we kind of described before. Perfect. But what you'll find is that even though we're not drawing perfect cell shapes, again, we can still do a pretty decent job at pulling out individual populations. Uh, we're also demarking those populations within the uh, the imaging, uh, the, the image rather, uh, so that we can go back and forth just like we can with cells and we can delete cells, we can appropriately segment cells into their individual compartments. Okay, uh, so either with uh, cells or with tissue, uh, the next step, or actually, you know, once we've done uh, a, an analysis uh, that we're, we're happy with, uh, we, we've come out with uh, individual populations that we're happy with, uh, the next step is uh, exporting those results. Um, so <clears throat> there's a couple of ways that we can do this. Uh, the first, if you're truly just interested in, you know, kind of the internal pipeline and I have X amount of phenotypes uh, and I want to export them, easiest way to do that, of course, is just uh, print statistics. So I'll, I'll decide I want to look at all my gates, select all, um, write all, all the metadata to those, and I can immediately uh, onboard get uh, descriptors about the populations that I have uh, demarked. Um, so for each one of these, uh, you get a designation of gate. Uh, you get the total cells in the gate. Um, <clears throat> you also get the percentage of the all gate, so all the cells that you uh, identified, and then uh, percentages of the parent gate. So you get that immediately. Tension of this internal pipeline is really, or the utility of the internal pipeline is really to uh, give access to these uh, multiplex cytometry tools uh, to those that are maybe, you know, not image analysis experts in the first place um, that would find it challenging to come up with their own image, image analysis pipeline. And if you look at it from that perspective, it's actually a rather full featured set of tools. It can get you all the way from images to actually uh, running through populations. Uh, however, as we've uh, kind of gotten into this and developed the software, developed the platform, uh, we do, of course, realize that are, uh, there are more powerful software platforms out there. There are machine learning algorithms out there uh, that can do segmentation in tissue better. Uh, so again, you know, this gives uh, a uh, kind of a novice user uh, a first taste at how to do this sort of work um, so that they can use those kind of introductory skills to, to build their pipelines accordingly. Um, and, you know, there's several people or several customers other that use this internal pipeline uh, to great effect. Uh, but of course, you know, we do not want to limit uh, uh, your data or your analysis to kind of our tool set. Uh, that's definitely not the intention. 
Um, so there's a there's a couple of very unique features uh, to this chip cytometry data set that makes it very um, highly extensible, as I put it. There's a lot that you can do with it. Um, first, of course, is you know HDR image acquisition, uh, but essentially from the same image uh, set or same composite, you're going to get the dimmest of the dim cells, well outside what you could ca capture with one exposure, and you're going to get the brightest of the bright cells, uh, well outside what you could capture in one exposure, all fused together. Another aspect of this data set, though, is that uh, because of the cyclic nature of the staining, and then imaging, and then photo bleaching, uh, this allows us for every round of imaging to actually collect more than just the net fluorescence that you might see in uh, that's typically published. Um, so we also must, in order to give you good uh, quantitative information, we must collect the background image here. So we uh, have that available for export. Um, we can also give you the uncorrected fluorescence uh, as well as the, uh, of course, the, uh, well, we talked about the net fluorescence and kind of not shown here, also the transmitted light image. Um, but the idea here is you get that in 32-bit for every single imaging round. Um, so it's just a ton of grist for the mill uh, for kind of higher-end image uh, analysis applications. Um, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning particularly uh, could definitely benefit from a data set that's rich like this. We also go to kind of great efforts to make sure that um, you can use these data uh, to their best benefit. Um, so we've made sure that they're actually compatible with uh, essentially every uh, commercial and every open source uh, platform that we could get our hands on. Uh, so we know, uh, for example, that these data sets work very well with uh, Indica Labs Halo. We know that they work with Visio Farm. Uh, we know that they work with NIS Elements. And the reason this is important is because a lot of people already have pipelines that they're using, and they don't necessarily uh, want to, nor should they have to re, uh, reinvent the wheel just to use our software. Uh, so instead, we just make the full raw in its full glory uh, image set avail available uh, to you for easy uh, import. Uh, so in this case, we're taking a look at NIS elements. Uh, this is kind of NIS elements used for whole slide segmentation, uh, then mean intensity calculation, and then they have a lot of nice data display features um, that we use to generate this heat map uh, where we're taking a look at, in this case, pancytic keratin, and then alternatively, at the same data set, taking a look at breast cancer, uh, excuse me, CD45. Um, so I thought this might be kind of nice to show. Uh, it's just to run this. It's just a little algorithm. Uh, I did this last night, not super fancy, <clears throat> where I could do something as simple as like just draw a circle, accept it. It'll think about stuff for a second. And instead of having the analysis over the entire uh, piece of tissue, it is instead going to just truncate that to this, uh, this spot. Um, so we can do things like, you know, take a look at a, uh, a TMA and then have it automatically find the individual spots in TMA and then separate those analyses um, uh, by itself. Um, what's cool about what's coming, though, is that that in itself basically just means that we could analyze this using this software, which is, you know, kind of beside the point. Uh, but what we've come up with is a scheme to actually take this segmentation, take this binary, and actually import it back into Zell Craftwork. So the other thing that we might do as far as distance, uh, so I also did a nice look, uh, lovely little example here, just on distance uh, distance metrics. Um, so same deal, I'm, I'll maybe draw a little smaller circle, uh, that way it's a little more dramatic here and hit run. <clears throat> so the other thing this has is kind of some post binary processing tools uh, and uh, post um, uh, post binary or post analysis uh, visualization tools here, which um, this takes a little bit longer to run on my machine. Um, <clears throat> but basically what I've asked it to do is calculate the distance between uh, every nuclei that it's found in that little spot uh, and then color the uh, color the uh, nuclei binary accordingly. Um, so that's what we've got here. Uh, same most certainly goes for uh, open source uh, pipelines. Um, <clears throat> so we know, of course, that because it's on OME TIFF, uh, this works in ImageJ, it works in QPath, it works in Cell Profiler. Uh, here is just an example. Uh, this is also out of that same uh, paper out of the Technical University of Munich. 
um, using kind of the power of ImageJ and Open Pipeline uh, in order to do some very uh, specific and very powerful uh, cell segmentation and further analysis. Uh, so in this case, you know, these just kind of showing standard segmentation. This is using Stardust uh, versus his kind of augmentation of this, where he's actually uh, using two separate pipeline in order to segment uh, epithelia uh, versus immune cells. And in doing so, he's just greatly increased uh, the number of cells identified, uh, which cuts down on double positives, cuts down on the rare cells that you might be losing out on, uh, generally provides you a better solution than if you just segmented them alone uh, by his publication. Uh, it turns out uh, that same uh, uh, kind of base algorithm of Stardust is also uh, included in uh, QPath, uh, which is a nice, easy, free uh, software package for looking at um, uh, primarily pathology samples, but it's very nice for looking at very, very large images um, that are uh, both, both large in size as well as large in numbers and channels. Uh, finally, our internal pipeline is also exportable. The results of our internal pipeline are also exportable. Uh, so if you go through image segmentation, uh, phenotyping through bivariate gating, um, and taking a look at those individual populations, really what you're doing is generating a list mode version of, uh, of your data. Um, so if we take a look at that as a raw file, which is every cell has a positive ID, every cell has an X and Y value associated with it. Uh, it's got a size, um, it has the values of every single thing that we collected. Um, <clears throat> so this essentially kind of digitizes your, uh, digitizes your, your um, data set. Um, and you really can. So, you know, this is kind of a map of our uh, image uh, and you can use this information then to actually make a map of these cells. Uh, when you look at it on aggregate, it actually does a pretty good job of mapping out this tissue. Um, <clears throat> so we can actually uh, export um, as a basically a digital, digitalized version, uh, this uh, map or cell map. Um, so this is looking at the all gate, um, but we can also do this for any of the analyses or any of the populations that we found. Uh, we can then cast that as just a digital version. Um, this pairs very well with uh, more bioinformatics type pipelines that are really just looking for raw data. Uh, basically, at that point, uh, the sample is essentially uh, digitized. Um, so you can generate very easily plots that maybe take a look, uh, look like this at locations of cells and you're looking at their expression values. Um, but what this can power uh, is things like uh, unsupervised clustering. Uh, in this case, we're taking a look at an example of chip cytometry data put through a UMAP um, algorithm in order to identify clusters kind of de novo. Uh, in this case, he was taking a look at his non-corrected versus uh, corrected data sets just to show that the clustering actually did increase when you uh, did his correction, um, as well as then the number of cl uh, clusters versus the uh, silhouette score. Um, all to say that he's improved it with this uh, new segmentation technique. Everything from the images themselves all the way through the pipeline with chip cytometry is easy to export. In summary, um, the ZKW app uh, still provides a lot of the functionality, the same functionality, of course, uh, through Cellscape that it does and did through uh, the Zell scanner. Uh, so we have on board an analysis pipeline that will take you from uh, compiling images all the way through uh, getting populations out of those. Uh, of course, I also hope I showed you the extensibility of that data set um, through a couple of examples of what you can do with that data uh, outside of the ZKW uh, pipeline. Uh, and that it has, you know, kind of base compatibility, both 16-bit and I think uh, importantly 32-bit, so you can actually get to the raw HDR files. Uh, but compatibility with ImageJ, compatibility with uh, Visual Farm, uh, essentially anyone that can import a, um, a uh, OME TIF. Um, <clears throat> I really appreciate your time again, and uh, I hope you have a uh, lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. All right, let's get started. Our first question asks, do you have a list of recommended tools for working with chip cytometry data? Uh, I do, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and that's <laughs> locating those tools uh, can be a bit of a bear. 
Um, I'd say the best resource to, uh, for people that I've seen so far um, is actually an article that uh, was uh, I mean, published. It's in uh, BioArvix um, <clears throat> that basically just lays out each of the tools that are available uh, kind of uh, as of uh, about a month ago. Um, but most importantly, kind of lays them out uh, in categories that are, uh, well, you know, how, how complicated or how extensive is that software package? Um, <clears throat> because the, uh, the problem is when you look at the tool set that people publish, a lot of times it's very difficult to tell whether they're talking about uh, something as simple as a function or a component of a piece of software um, or, an, or an, entirely, uh, an entire software suite. Um, you have to do a bit of digging um, to, to kind of get at that answer. Um, so that's something I can kind of add uh, as uh, I'll, I'll add that link uh, as an answer to that question. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that's probably the best place I would say to look. Um, as far as the short list um, for uh, specifically multiplexed uh, image sets, uh, really QPath seems to be the best as far as um, open source imaging uh, pipelines. Uh, it's basically kind of a, a it's built on top of ImageJ, uh, but specifically for looking at these very large data sets that are in both large and in size, uh, as well as numbers of channels. Um, if you want to go for a paid option, uh, I'd certainly recommend Halo or uh, VisioFarm. Uh, those are kind of purpose built for this kind of stuff too. Uh, and the difference between the two is uh, essentially whether you want your resources to go into personal time or you uh, just essentially uh, paying paying for support. Um, so if, if you have lots of time on your hands and the intention is to learn how to make these pipelines and how to uh, employ them, then I would definitely go the uh, open source route. If you're really just looking to employ pipelines, I'd probably go for a paid, uh, a, a, a pay for service or a pay for platform. Great. Thank you, Spencer. Another sure. question we have here asks, what are the advantages of HDR imaging in spatial biology? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've really kind of found this to be uh, essentially, you know, it's it, it's essential to uh, doing this correctly. Um, and the issue is not necessarily like the sensitivity of the camera or the bit depth of the camera. It's nothing to do with kind of the physics of the instruments. They're all capable of collecting, you know, kind of the dimness of the dim cells, the brightest of the bright cells. Um, the issue is in any one particular exposure with the camera system, that you're not able to collect the full breadth of both the dim cells and the bright cells. Um, so you're kind of intrinsically biasing yourself either to uh, either looking for very, very uh, uh, high sensitivity, but kind of blowing out your uh, linear range on bright cells. Um, so you're only going to really be quantifying things like, you know, PDL1 or PD1 um, at the sacrifice of brighter signals like, you know, uh, CD4 or CD8, just as common examples. Um, you really do have to take multiple exposures over uh, uh, different exposure bracketing and put that all together to get a true idea of what's going on within your sample. So it's, we found this is really, really important um, <clears throat> to, uh, uh, to really kind of specifying where a cell's uh, phenotype or where the expression level is truly lies uh, kind of relative to the actual biology that's going on as opposed to just the signal and noise of a particular camera. Uh, so bringing it outside of just the physics of your instrument requires uh, multiple exposures. And to deal with those multiple exposures, the most common uh, tool to use is, is HDR imaging or HDR composition. Great. All right. Looks like we have time for one more question here. So we'll go ahead and wrap up with this one. Are the full pipelines mentioned in the talk available somewhere? Uh, sure. So the um, the internal pipeline, the chip cytometry, uh, so that that is uh, kind of uh, proprietary to us. Um, but if you'd like to take a look at how that kind of works, um, if you go to our website, uh, canopybiosciences.com and search through uh, to find our support page, we have lots of videos on, you know, kind of the, the inner workings of it. Um, that'll give you a flavor for kind of how how uh, how things are going within the software. Um, the two examples that I did or, or I presented as far as external uh, software, third-party software, uh, those were done in NIS Elements, uh, which is a software package uh, that's licensed through uh, Nikon Instruments. Um, <clears throat> in that case, you know, those, if, if you happen to also be an Elements user, uh, I, I can export and, and give, you those, uh, give you those recipes uh, so that you can do um, your own internal analysis with our pipeline. Um, <clears throat> for the QPath and uh, kind of the ones that I mentioned there, um, as far as kind of uh, open source uh, solutions, I definitely point you towards uh, Sebastian, 
Gross uh, publication that he's just put out on uh, there was an A star method, um, as well as another uh, another publication where he goes through and basically lays out a pipeline that goes all the way from chip cytometry data um, to doing uh, you know cluster analysis uh, all as one package. Uh, so that's freely available as well. I might just take a look at the reference uh, within the slide. Fantastic. Well, thank you again, Spencer, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Canopy Biosciences, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd also like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, everyone. Goodbye.